It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone, live from the green space. Remember, when we're in the green space, you can watch as well as listen to the show. We are streaming live video at WNYC.org or on the WNYC Facebook page. Now, this hour of the Brian Lehrer Show is a public service for listeners in Queens that should also be very interesting for everyone else. It's a candidate's debate in probably the most consequential election being held in New York City this year for Queens District Attorney. And that's a big deal in the context of this era of criminal justice reform, where the debate is as much about what a district attorney is for as it is about the candidates and their qualifications. Consider this. The winner will succeed Richard Brown, who passed away last month after being in office as Queens DA since 1991. And here's an indication of how times have changed in the context of this race. The New York Times obit of Brown last month included this passage. Civic leaders and politicians praised Mr. Brown for giving a high degree of attention to mundane crimes whose prosecutions were nevertheless important to neighborhood residents. In 1999, Claire Shulman, then the Queens Burr president, cited Mr. Brown's efforts against offenses like prostitution and graffiti. And here's her quote. He helped close 45 houses of prostitution on Roosevelt Avenue, and that had been a serious quality of life issue for the people who lived around it, unquote. Well, that was then. One of the things we'll hear in this debate, no doubt, is how completely to leave sex workers and the sex industry alone in 2019. And praising someone for going after mundane crimes would sound to many like saying, hooray for mass incarceration. I think we will hear some candidate differences on this spectrum today. This race features one candidate endorsed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, two that have a lot of union support, a former judge who always wanted to be Queens DA endorsed by the Daily News, and three more. And with that as prelude, let me welcome my co-questioner for this debate, Christine Chung, the Queens correspondent for the new nonprofit news organization, The City. Hi, Christine. Hey, Brian. Many have described the race to be the next Queens District Attorney as a fight to be the most progressive reformer of this crowded field. Today, we want to explore the ideological differences between the candidates and unpack the subtleties of their positions. And now let's meet the seven candidates. They are Queens Borough President Melinda Katz, Jose Nieves, combat veteran and former deputy chief in the New York State Attorney General's office, former Queens prosecutor and retired New York State Supreme Court Justice Greg Lasak, Tiffany Caban, a public defender, <laughs> Betty Lugo, we know who rallied their troops out today, <laughs> Betty Lugo, former Nassau County Assist Assistant District Attorney, now in private practice, Mina Malik, former prosecutor in Queens and Washington, lecturer at Harvard Law School and former executive director of the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, Queens City Councilman Rory Lantzman. Uh, please welcome all our candidates. <laughs> and Christine, you've, you've got the rules. Uh, the rules are simple, roughly 60 second answers to each question. If one of your rivals name checks you, you can respond, but we can't go back and forth forever. Um, and we, the moderators, will have the discretion to draw it and exchange a little bit if we think it clarifies something and serves the voters. All right. <clears throat> so now on to the first question. And uh, let's start in the back over there. So that's going to be Councilman Lansman. And we're going to go around this way. And then we're going to keep rotating around this way. And each of you will you know, get the first response in subsequent rounds as we go around. How do you each see the role of the Queens DA in 2019 as being different from when Richard Brown got the job in 1991? 60 seconds for your answer, Mr. Lansman. Thank you, and it's good to be back on the show, Brian and Christine, it's good to be with you. Um, when Dick Brown became district attorney uh, in 1991, uh, New York was in the middle of an epic crime wave. And as a result of that, I think that his approach to uh, addressing crime was shaped entirely by a punitive carceral mentality. We need to lock up as many people for as long as possible. And even as crime declined in the city, even as the city became safer, that mentality never left the Queens District Attorney's Office. Today, Queens sends more people charged with misdemeanors to Rikers Island than any other borough. And I am running to break that cycle of over-policing, 
and mass incarceration. And the record that I have in the council in saving hundreds of thousands of people from the criminal justice system, in attacking broken windows policing, in mitigating the evils of cash bail, is, with all due respect to Mr. Brown and his legacy, okay. a referendum and a repudiation of what that office has become. Thank you. Ms. Malik. Yes, so back in the time when Richard Brown took office, certainly there was a crime wave, just as Councilman Lansman said. And what I need to do and what I will do as district attorney is make sure that we are not prosecuting crimes of poverty, crimes of substance use disorder, and people with mental health issues. Those are the three core tenets that I think we can do today to move the district attorney's f office forward to the 21st century and to a modern day district attorney's office. So my platform includes restoring fundamental fairness, making sure we're eliminating economic oppression, holding law enforcement accountable where they need to be held accountable, and concentrating on the serious crimes, not the low-level offenses that do nothing but saddle people with a criminal conviction and give them collateral consequences. And finally, making sure that the district attorney's office is diverse, inclusive, transparent, and accountable to the people of Queens County. The leadership has to reflect the county of Queens. Thank you. And Ms. Lugo. I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I also started the first Hispanic woman-owned law firm in New York, Pacheco and Lugo, at One World Trade Center 27 years ago. I've championed civil rights, economic fraud, and economic rights my entire life. I also worked for Shirley Chisholm's campaign when she ran for president. That's my background. I was the first Hispanic woman at the Nassau County DA's office right around the time Richard Brown became Queens DA. I know what it's like to be different because when I was at the DA's office, I saw what crimes were being prosecuted. There was no diversity. There were no interpreters. There was no consideration, compassion, or mercy. DA Brown, with all due respect, kept the crime statistics down in Queens. However, he later on, it got outdated. His policies are outdated. I propose a community DA's office, one that includes the community with their input, transparency, accountability, and let the public tell us what you want, Thank how it should be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Caban. Thank you. Uh, you know, DA Brown was the district attorney for the majority of my life, 27 years of my, my 31 years of, of being on this earth. And um, what he did was he took this tough on crimes approach that perpetuated our system of the mass incarceration of our black and brown communities. <laughs> um, you know, it's part of the reason why I became a public defender as a queer Latina from a working class family whose parents grew up in housing projects, understanding that coming up in over policed, over criminalized, resource starved communities and being a public defender, representing folks who couldn't afford to defend themselves, that our system is the most powerful driver of the continued oppression of our black and brown, low-income immigrant, queer, and, and, um, and other communities. And so what we need, because we've been sold this false promise of safety through cultures of convictions at all costs, what we need are public defenders metrics, reducing recidivism, decarcerating, applying the law fairly across racial and class lines. And that, that approach, that progressive prosecutor approach, that decarceral approach, are the things that public defenders have always known and always done. So this is certainly a continuation of the work that I've done. Thank you very Thank you. much, Ms. Katz. I think the role of the Queen's uh, District Attorney has changed over the years, and the District Attorney's Office has not evolved. We still need to keep families safe, get victims justice, make sure that we have justice for defendants, but how we do that is very different. I am not a career prosecutor. Instead, I spent the last 30 years of my life standing up to po powerful interests. In the New York State Assembly, I stood up to the Catholic Church to pass legislation to toll statute of limitations for victims of child sexual abuse so that I could get them justice. As the Queensborough President, I run a multi-million dollar office with a borough-wide reach that every single day we stand up to Donald Trump, we stand up against his dangerous policies, and we fight for immigrants, and we fight for those that have no voice in the borough of Queens. As the district attorney, I will end cash bail. I will make sure that we have bureaus of immigration, protection, worker protection, and tenant protection. But this is too important a job to leave to someone who doesn't have the history or the skill experience to actually make the criminal justice reform needed Thank that we have to have and also keep our borough safe. Thank you very much. Mr. Nieves. You know, in 91, uh, around that time, I was growing up in East New York, Brooklyn, which was one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city. And I saw a lot of violent crime in the streets, so I knew why public safety was so important. But I also saw the war on drugs play out in, in my neighborhood. And the war on drugs ended up being a war on 
black and brown people of, in my community. Because uh, with the combination of the war on drugs, the Rockefeller drug laws, and other uh, incarceration um, geared policies, a lot of people that I grew up with ended up being incarcerated. And that's what motivated me to change the system from within. That's what motivated me to become an attorney and, and become a prosecutor, to try to change the system from within. As a district attorney, what I'm going to do is make sure we decarcerate uh, our population at Rikers Island by, you know, di divi di you know, diverting from the criminal justice system whenever possible, by not prosecuting low-level offenses that don't directly relate to public safety, by making sure that we have no cash bail and engaging in, in more Thank proactive uh, policies. Thank you very much. And Mr. Lasak. Yes, I, re I resigned my Supreme Court judgeship last September to run for district attorney because I've been a lifelong resident of Queens and I care about this county. The district attorney is the chief law enforcement official of the county. Number one, we have to keep you safe. Number two, we have to make sure there's no abuse by any law enforcement officials. In that sense, I led the investigation into the 106th precinct where police officers were torturing prisoners with a stun gun and I wound up indicting five police officers. Also, in the 90s, it came to my attention that there were claims of innocent men in prison, and I reinvestigated those cases on my own, and I was able to exonerate over 20 men of color who were wrongfully arrested, indicted, or convicted, some staying in prison for five, six, seven years of crimes, including murder, Thank rape, and robbery. Thank and I intend to do that when I come back. Thank you very much. Listeners, if you're just joining us, you're listening to the Queens DA Democratic primary debate with all seven candidates live on the Green Space stage here at WNYC. The primary is Tuesday, June 25th. The next question comes from Christine Chung, Queens correspondent for the news organization, The City. How can you each reassure the voters of Queens that you would strike the right balance between criminal justice reform and keeping Queens safe from criminals? So we'll start with Ms. Malik on this. So I've actually already done it. And everybody up here on the stage is talking about implementing criminal justice reform, but no one has actually done it. As Deputy Attorney General, we made sure that we implemented alternatives to incarceration while keeping the public safe, anti-truancy initiatives to break the school to prison pipeline, diversion courts to help people with mental health issues, as well as substance use disorder. So I've already done that in terms of making sure that as a prosecutor we're keeping the public safe. I also did it in terms of being a prosecutor and special counsel to Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson. We established a conviction review unit where we looked at wrongful claims of, claims of wrongful conviction and in the five years since we established the unit, we exonerated and freed 26 wrongfully convicted people. It's important to make sure that we have justice for all, but that we are keeping the community safe. And having been on both the defense and the prosecution side, I know exactly what that entails. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Lugo. My entire life I've dedicated to civil rights. I've wanted to be a district attorney or a criminal attorney since Perry Mason, for those of you who go way back. And that's my life. I grew up in Bed-Stuy where there was a lot of crime. And what I saw was that you know, maybe I should be on the defense side because they're abusing my people. However, I realized that my people were also the victims and nobody was speaking out for the victims. There has to be an equal balance. There must be true justice for all. There must be second chances, compassion and mercy. But the victim, the victim must always come first because you must listen to the victim and find out what happened and then go there, go on from there and investigate. That's how you reassure the public that there is trust in the system. As to the defendants, yes, we must have second and third chances if necessary, compassion and mercy. However, we also must have respect for the criminal justice system. The only way I know how Thank to do you. that is by providing diversity in the judiciary and in the, and the uh, criminal justice system. Thank you. Ms. Caban? You know, in, in terms of striking the right balance, uh, I, I just, I also want to say that 
I, I take issue with with using the term criminals. Like too often, we're using this binary system of well, good people and bad people. We need to lock up the bad people, but what, really, what we're talking about are just people, right? And so, what we need to do is take these trauma informed, holistic approaches that get to the root causers of behavior, so that we're changing behavior. Because right now, there is nothing corrective or rehabilitative about our correctional system. So for me, it's. Uh, about making sure that we are investing resources in stabilizing communities because when you have stable lives, access to basic needs, whether it's where you're gonna lay your head down at night, healthcare access, job and education opportunities, those are the best ways to drive down crime, whether it is low level, nonviolent, or violent crime. And when we make that really impactful, important decision to remove somebody from their community, understanding that 97, 98% of the time, they will re-enter their communities. And so what are we doing to make sure that people don't harm again and, and recidivize it? And that, again, Thank comes you. from understanding their traumas and, and doing the work to change behavior. Ms. Katz. It is so crucial to have a balance of criminal justice reform and safety. I'm the only candidate in this race that has worked top to bottom, east to west, in the borough of Queens with all of the cure violence groups, with the mental health clinics, with the drug abuse clinics, and gone borough by bur neighborhood by neighborhood to make sure that we are actually keeping people out of the system before they get into the system. You can have justice for defendants, but the real secret here is to make sure that we are stopping anyone from going into the system. So you have to have people going to schools. You have to have folks that have done time statewide, going into our junior high schools and our high schools. I have gone and worked with so many of the Cure Violence groups on gun violence to make sure that people understand that gun violence is a public health issue. We need to involve the guidance counselors. We need to involve the teachers. That is why I'm so proud to have the support of the UFT, who knows that I will work with the children to make sure that they don't feel like they need to pick up a gun to be safe. They are just as safe not picking up a gun. But you can't do it if you don't have the experience, the knowledge, and all of the qualifications Thank to run you. a multi-million dollar office in the borough of Queens. Mr. Nieves? I, th I believe I bring the right balance to the uh, position as district attorney because I'm the only candidate on this stage that has actually felt the discrimination of the criminal justice system because I myself have been stopped and frisked by the police and held and asked to be put in a lineup. And I've, I felt the, the, the you know, disrespect and the indignity of, of, of being subject to over-policing in my community. But I also uh, dedicated my uh, entire 18-year career to progressive prosecutions, to making sure we divert individuals away from the criminal justice system, to making sure that we we don't have a discriminatory uh, criminal justice system that punishes individuals because they're poor, because they have no, don't have access to, to resources. And I think that's the balance that the Queens residents are looking for. Someone who knows that the criminal justice has problems, but somebody who has the right a combination of experience to know to do the job, how to do the job, and how to identify the threat to the public safety. Thank you. Mr. Lisak? While in the DA's office, I helped start the first diversion programs. I worked with the second chance program. And our goal was to try to save as many of the young people as possible because once you get a criminal record, you're prevented from getting into a good school or getting a good job with a union or other things like that. So our goal was always to prevent people from getting tied up in the system. I also, as a Supreme Court judge, my first assignment was to sit in the drug treatment part. And one by one, we were able to save individuals had, who had the disease of addiction, and that was very rewarding. But we also must never forget that, as I said before, the DA is the chief law enforcement official. I was the chief of homicide and the executive assistant in charge of all major crimes. I had to speak with the mothers of little girls that got killed, little boys going to school that got killed, and we must never forget about the victims. The DA must be the voice for the victims. Mr. Lantzman. So I've been doing this work as a council member for five and a half years, and before that as an assembly member for six years. As a public official, you are responsible for doing your part to make sure that your community is safe, but also to make sure that our criminal justice system is fair. So an example, there are hundreds of thousands of people who were getting um, being run through the criminal justice system for these low-level broken windows offenses that are nonetheless important quality of life issues for me and my constituents. So we took those offenses out of the criminal justice system and put them in the civil system instead. So people are still held accountable for doing things that are, that are wrong and that are inappropriate, but they're not getting a criminal record for the rest of their life. That's the balance. I wanted to talk about the balance, though, in a different way. For 19 years as a lawyer in private practice, I represented working people, women who are 
sexually harassed on the job, people whose wages were stolen from them, people who were injured or killed on the job because their employer didn't care about their safety. The criminal justice system pays almost no attention Thank to you. those issues. And that's a form of balance I want to bring to the office as well. Okay, listeners, if you're just joining us, this is the Queens District Attorney Democratic Primary Debate here on WNYC with all seven candidates in the June 25th primary here in the green space. Um, our next question comes from one of the audience members. We have a lot of people from Queens here today. We were giving out free tickets for this for registered Queens voters, and we invited people to submit questions. And one of them says, after having served, <coughs> excuse me, after having served on a Queens County grand jury in 2016, I need to know how anyone can claim that they are qualified to be DA with no prosecutorial experience. So we'll use this as a general hook for each of you to talk about your experience and why you think it does make you the best qualified for this job. And as we continue to rotate who goes first, Ms. Lugo, it's your turn. Okay. The, um, it's, it's very good that you have experience serving on a jury or a grand jury. And if, for those of you who have not, I recommend that you sit in on a jury selection or sit in on a trial because it's important. It's important to learn head on what's going on in Queens and have a voice. I've been, um, like I said, I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I started my law firm 27 years ago. There's several cases that I've taken, criminal cases that I've taken, that I've changed the law on. One on economic fraud, where they were bringing people in from uh, to close loans in New Jersey, a lot of small businesses here in Manhattan. And I sued in federal court under RICO, the racketeering uh, statute. And we made new law on that case. Also the Cypress Hill Cemetery case where they were burying people in garbage. When I went to the AG's office, the DA's office, the mayor's office, we had protests. No one did anything. The Pet Cemetery case got more respect and acknowledgement than burying blacks and Hispanics in garbage. And um, going back to the question, well, it's important to we know to pro to know about how to do a criminal we case. Have to leave you it must there. be an experienced me, prosecutor. We have, we have to stick with the clock. Okay. Uh, and listeners, there is a big countdown clock here on the stage, just so you know that they know. And Ms. Caban, you're next. You know, traditional prosecution experience is what got us here in the first place in, in terms of the devastation to our black and brown and low-income immigrant communities. Um, so we need a clean break from that. And we're seeing around the country that Communities are recognizing that defense experience is actually incredibly important. Just last night in Virginia, public defenders were, were voted into their district attorney positions because when we talk about this decarceral approach, these new way of doing things, again, these are the things that certainly here in New York, public defenders have been fighting for on the front lines in court and up in Albany for decades. It is a continuation of the work that we have always done. You know, I'm really proud of the fact that I have the endorsement of, of DA Larry Krasner from Philadelphia, who is the trailblazer, right, of progressive decarceral prosecution in our country, a public defender, a defense attorney leading the charge on these things. And so the tide is turning and the understanding that this is the right and the relevant experience for the changes um, that we are calling for to dismantle our system of mass incarceration. Thank you. Ms. Katz. I'm in a 30-year attorney, and for 25 years, I've been standing up to powerful interests every single day. And I agree, a career prosecutor is exactly why we are all sitting here today. Because if you're a career prosecutor, you're a part of the problem that has caused mass incarceration, the destabilization of communities. What I believe the Queens District Attorney needs is someone who can effectuate the change necessary for criminal justice reform. Because let me tell you something, across the country, people are going to be looking at Queens on how we do this. And if we don't do it right, it will hurt the criminal justice reform movement throughout this country. We need someone with sound judgment. But we especially need someone who can run a multi-million million dollar office and work with every one of the groups in the borough of Queens. If you want diversion programs and you really want to make them happen, if you want mental health clinics, if you want to make sure that people are not spending time in jail on Rikers, because no one's getting better at Rikers, they're only getting worse. If you want to make sure that actually happens and is effectuated, you need someone who can put the system in place, someone who can fight for those that have done it their whole career. But Fair. you certainly do not need a career prosecutor. Thank you. Mr. Nieves. 
You know, this is when uh, experience trumps political rhetoric. And I believe that, the di you know, to, to understand that the district attorney is the chief law enforcement officer of the county and is in charge of over, six, over 300 uh, district attorneys and other investigators is so important because we're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about serious crime like murder, rape, burglary. These are serious matters that experience demands, uh, d you know, sound decisions. And, and the fact of the matter is when you don't have that d d experience, you you have to rely on others, and you're and you're electing the person with the experience to do the job, and that's why I'm I'm the most you know qualified to do the job because I have an experience, and that type of experience is in incredibly important. I've been holding the system accountable by prosecuting police officers for killing unarmed civilians. I've been holding uh, correction officers responsible for abusing individuals at on um, you know Rikers Island and, and ex engaging in excessive force. That's the type of experience you want as a district attorney, somebody who's not only going to prosecute violent crime, but but also hold the system accountable, make sure it's fair for everybody. Thank you very much. Mr. Lasak. I de dedicated 25 years of my life to the Queens DA's office. 19 of those years, I was either a bureau chief of homicide or an executive assistant. I was responsible for all the major cases in Queens for the most of my career. Became a Supreme Court judge. I was elected. I spent a 14-year term there, and I resigned after one, one, nine months into my second term. I resigned my judgeship with 13 years left on it. I resigned as the deputy administrative judge. The DA must be experienced in this area. The DA must know criminal law. Otherwise, how can the DA be in charge of 330 lawyers that are handling 50,000 cases a year? Because the ultimate decision on cases, whether to lock someone up and charge them with murder, whether to let someone go because they're innocent, that decision has to be made by the DA, not an underling. An underling makes a recommendation, Thank but you. the DA himself must or herself must make that decision. Thank you, Mr. Lanceman. Well, if you're looking to reform the criminal justice system and you're serious about building a different system than what we have now, you don't want to look to the people who built the system that we're trying to break down today. So that's the bottom line. In terms of experience as a lawyer, Look, if you, all you're looking for is a district attorney who's going to continue the kind of meat grinder system that we have right now, then no, you don't need any uh, one with any particular uh, legal acumen. But for 19 years, I was an experienced lawyer representing people in state and federal court in complicated individual and class action cases. I know my way around a courtroom. I know my way around a case. If you want to enlighten the district attorney's office, if you want to have a district attorney's office that's actually going to um, bring cases that are important to working people, cases of wage theft, cases of deed fraud, cases of mortgage fraud, cases of landlords harassing um, tenants out of their, their apartment, you need someone with a different skill set than, as I put it, the meat grinder of the current criminal justice that, system. That. That's what I bring to this <coughs> office. And Ms. Malik. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very critical race. We are talking about an office of 600 people with 300 prosecutors and 300 unionized workers. It is extremely important that the district attorney has experience and qualifications to do this job. I asked the borough president last night on our New York One debate a simple question about basic criminal law in terms of grand jury practice, and she couldn't answer it. You have to walk into this office on day one with street credibility with the NYPD, with the bar, with the defense bar, and with the public as well as the people in the office. I have already done both the defense side as well as the prosecution. I've worked alongside police officers. I've also held them accountable as the head of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. It is extremely important and we cannot get this wrong because we are dealing with people's lives. I've been endorsed by three former heads of the D.C. Public Defender Service, former prosecutors such as Carter Stewart, who's married to Michelle Alexander, and author thank, of The New Jim Crow. Thank you very we much. We have to get this right. And Ms. Katz, since you were name-checked there, or more accurately title-checked, you'll get a brief response. This is exactly why you don't want career prosecutors being the district attorney in this day and time of criminal justice reform. We can talk about the grand jury. We can talk about the fact that we have 12 people that have to be able to vote. We could talk about 16 quorum. We could talk about the number. But at the end of the day, if someone acts like this when we're not even in with the defendant and someone thinks that the gotcha attitude is how you win, that's not going to work as the district attorney's office. You need to be able to gather the forces and the trust when you have the discretion as the district attorney's okay. office. Change will not that. happen if you can't do that. 
Thank you. Uh, listeners, if you're tuning in just now, this is the Queens DA Democratic primary debate on WNYC with all seven candidates here in the green space. And Christine Chung from the city has the next question, which goes first to Ms. Kabat. Ms. Kabat has a decline to prosecute list of certain crimes. It includes the following. <coughs> Sorry. Marijuana, fair beats, prostitution, massage parlors, airport taxis, unlicensed driving, trespassing, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, um, possession of gravity knives, bumping up felony gravity knife cases, loitering, drug possession, welfare fraud, recreational drug-related crimes, sex work-related charges, and any crimes of poverty, mental illness, or substance use disorder. Who disagrees with any of those? Though Ms. Kavan gets the first response, right. so would you uh, defend that list or explain it? I mean, absolutely. What we have to stop doing is punting public health issues to our justice system. We are criminalizing poverty. We are criminalizing mental health. We are criminalizing substance use. You know, I, I always say that in Queens, what we have done is historically thrown black and brown people in jail for jumping turnstiles for having small amounts of marijuana. But when your landlord turns off your heat in the middle of the winter, nothing happens. So it's not just about what try like things that you're not going to prosecute, but being really efficient with those resources and saying that we're going to start holding bad actors accountable and prosecute those cases as early and as often as we can that are destabilizing entire communities. So instead of prosecuting and criminalizing my client who is struggling with substance use disorder, let's prosecute that doctor who's overprescribing opioids. Instead of criminalizing my client for being homeless, let's prosecute landlords who are unlawfully evicting and predatory lenders who are stealing homes. Let's prosecute employers who are stealing wages, misclassifying workers, and in Queens, we have the most work site deaths mm -hmm. in our city. We as need to, to continue with those kinds of prosecutions. As we go around, I'm curious to hear, I think our listeners would be, um, if there's anything on that list that you disagree with, that you would prosecute, that she wouldn't. Ms. Katz. Can you read the list again? I'm sorry. <laughs> or should we just go through it? We wouldn't prosecute. Um, I mean, it's marijuana, fair beats, prostitution, massage parlors, airport taxi, unlicensed driving, trespassing, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, bump up burglary in the third degree felonies, possession of gravity knives, that just got legalized anyway, bump up uh, well, loitering, drug possession, and welfare fraud, in addition to recreational drug-related crimes and sex-related charges, sex work-related charges, and any crimes of poverty, mental illness, or substance use and, disorders. And if I may clarify very, very briefly, Please. Um, in, the, in the list, one of the things that we included was resisting arrest, and that is in some situations. So I just want to be clear. As a defense attorney, when you pick up a new case and the only charge on that complaint is resisting arrest, or obstructing governmental administration, you know that there's something very, very wrong with that case. You know that most likely it was a pretextual stop gone wrong, that the police officer didn't know what to do at that point, okay. and then charged resisting arrest. And that's something we have to be incredibly critical of. Thank you so much. So anything to add to or subtract to that list? I, uh, I, think, that I, list? I think I agree with most of that list. I think I agree with all of it. Um, but I think it's, it's a matter of what we do with it instead. So instead of arresting people for marijuana, which by the way is an excuse for stop and frisk, so many of us fought against stop and frisk a decade ago, and we finally got it, and now marijuana arrests are being used to do the exact same thing. Instead of just saying, well, people are using drugs, we need to make sure that if we're not going to arrest for low-level drug crimes, or not going to convict for low-level drug crimes, like in Brooklyn, uh, like in the Bronx, like in Staten Island, Manhattan, where they are diverting those crimes, we need to make sure that we're getting people into the services they need. And we also have to make sure that we're not setting people up for failure. We need safe injection sites in the borough of Queens and all over the city of New York. It's the same fight that we had exchanging needles like 20 years ago. We're giving out condoms that we had 20 years ago. Everyone thought the sky was going to fall. But at the end of the day, it was safer. We we had educational opportunities, and we were better able to service people who truly needed it so they never ended up in the system. We Thank need you. to stop prosecuting low-level crimes <clears throat> as well so that the court system is unclogged for the higher crimes. Got it. Mr. Nieves? I agree that we need to decriminalize uh, poverty and drug addiction. I think that, you know, for many years we found that, you know, incarcerated, we can't incarcerate away our drug problem in America. And we, we have to do better at diverting individuals from the criminal justice system. In Brooklyn, they have the CLEAR project where they take an individual who's been uh, arrested for criminal possession of controlled substance, and at the precinct, they send out a, a social worker to, to, to counsel them and to divert them away from the criminal justice system before they even come to court. That's the, wire, that's the approach that we 
we should be using, not charging individuals who have a drug problem. It's not a criminal justice issue, it's a public health issue. Uh, but I, I take exception to one, one thing on that list, which is the uh, prosecution of massage parlors. I believe that you know when you have a human trafficking problem in Queens like we do, you have to be very careful that individuals and landlords and business owners are not b becoming safe havens for human trafficking uh, you know, rings and safe haven for human trafficking activities. And that's why you can have a, a clear arbitrary, you know, arbitrary um, you. A cutoff on, on massage parlors. Mr. Lasak. I, I don't believe in mass uh, justice. Every case has an individual set of facts and individuals, the accused and the other witnesses and everything. Everything is unique unto itself. I don't believe in making a blanket statement like this. I believe in giving everyone a second chance, giving them diversion programs, but I'm not going to make any blanket statement. For example, fare evasion. Sure, that's not a violent crime. Everyone says, all right. But then, what do you do when half the people coming on the subway aren't paying, and the people who are paying with the Metro card are getting annoyed? Why should we pay? Then you have no system. That's, what, that's why the transit system has gone into deficit all these years. It's bad. You got to really remember that. So I believe in second chances and diversion programs, but we can't have any blanket Got ideas it. that we're not going to prosecute. Got it. So in other words, sorry to interrupt, but in other words, no <laughs> decline to prosecute list, just case by case basis. A case by case basis, except like a little bag of marijuana. But, <laughs> All right. But no. Mr. Mr. Lanceman. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, first, let me clarify something, because I've been one of the leaders in trying to decriminalize fare evasion. It's not that someone who jumps the turnstile can't be held accountable or shouldn't be held accountable in the civil system. The same way that I have a, parked my car outside, I, if I, I, I paid the meter, if I'm late, nobody comes and puts handcuffs on me and sends me off to jail. I get a ticket. That's how we should deal with a lot of these offenses. M Ms. Caban's list is very familiar to me, because when I announced several months before she did in September, I had a similar list. Let me just identify a couple of things that I didn't hear on the list, which is we're not going to prosecute cases of juveniles. I was a leader in the fight to raise the age in New York City to treat 16 and 17 year olds as kids, not as adults. The law that was passed to raise the age was progress, but it still leaves a lot of discretion for prosecutors to try to keep cases of young people in adult court. I have said that to the full ex fullest extent that the law allows, I will not prosecute 16 and 17 year olds as adults. Ms. Malley? Yes. So as Deputy Attorney General, in dealing with diversion courts and alternatives to incarceration, I firmly believe that that's how we need to deal with crimes of poverty, crimes of substance abuse, where people have substance abuse disorder, and people who have mental health issues. Two of the things that I noticed on the list were, number one, welfare fraud. And while I would not seek to prosecute people who commit welfare fraud out of economic desperation, I do think that there are some people who take advantage of the system who already have funds and who take advantage of the system and commit welfare fraud. So I think we have to look at those cases where it's not being done out of economic desperation, but it's being done by people who have funds, who have the economic resources, and who are simply taking advantage of the system, and we need to hold them accountable. With respect to the sex trade industry, I firmly believe that we should be following the Nordic model and going after the demand side of people involved in prostitution, not criminalizing you. sex workers or prostitutes, but helping them and, and making sure that we are holding people accountable who are pimps and Johns and the sex okay. traffickers. Ms. Lugo? I agree with um, a few items on the list. And um, I believe in looking at a case, case by case basis and looking at the individual responsibilities and what happened. So if you have a trespass and it's because somebody keeps on parking on your spot or they they went into your home, then, you know, doesn't that victim deserve a right to be heard and find out what's going on? That's what I would, I would have a mediation unit. There has to be an in-between step. Prosecute, don't prosecute. In the middle, mediation. Bring in the community. Bring in the faith-based groups. Bring in the community-based groups. And ask, should there be some alternative uh, prosecution or civil matter, whatever. So have the person pay um, community service, do some community service. If it's Medicaid fraud or med welfare fraud, have them pay back 
restitution. However, there has to be. We live in an orderly society. We want to continue living in an orderly, respected society. We rely on that. And as the Queens DA, I represent the people Thank of you. the state of New York, of the county of Queens, and I will ensure safety to everybody. And Thank I, you. I just asked for 30 seconds for a but since I think by <laughs> the, the question's very nature, it sort of Ms. addresses Caban, me directly. go ahead. So, you know, one of the things that I want to point out is that declining to prosecute things does not mean um, putting somebody in the system and then forcing them to do an alternative to incarceration or diversion. There's something to be said for prosecuting with restraint and understanding that in a lot of ways, any contact with our system is incredibly destabilizing. And when we talk about our system being broken, it includes the manner in which that we approach alternatives to incarceration and, um, and other programs, because a lot of times they're very punitive in nature and, and oftentimes set people up for failure. And so really we should allow people to go back to their lives with access to supports and services in a non-coercive manner. Thank you very much. May I respond to that? Very briefly. Well, Ms. We, cannot, we cannot continue looking at how am I gonna let somebody off the hook? You have to have order in our society. You have to respect the victim. The victim comes first. Thank you. Well, I have to say something. Mr. Here, because Lansman. Order does not need to be maintained. <clears throat> order does not need to be maintained through the criminal justice system. There are other ways that we can maintain order, maintain um, our quality of life, keep us safe, other than through the heavy hammer of the criminal justice system. No heavy hammer involved. Thank you, all, Judge, I Mr. Lasak, briefly. I I was not talking about prosecuting fair beaters. I was talking about them having a summons returnable in the Transit Adjudication Bureau. We will continue in a minute with our Queens DA Democratic primary debate on WNYC ahead of the June 25th primary. Stay with us. It's the Brian Lehrer Show live in the green space today, and we have about 15 minutes left in our Democratic primary debate for Queens DA ahead of that June 25th primary with all seven candidates. Jose Nieves, combat veteran and former deputy chief in the New York State Attorney General's office, former Queens prosecutor and retired New York State Supreme Court Justice Greg Lasak, Tiffany Caban, a public defender, Betty Lugo, former Nassau County Assistant District Attorney now in private practice, Mina Malik, former prosecutor in Queens and Washington, a lecturer at Harvard Law School and former executive director of the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City, and Queens City Councilman Rory Lansman. The next question is another question submitted by one of the Queens residents, or at least they claim to be, in the audience here at the Green Space. And the question is, should the mayor's proposed plan for four jails to replace Rikers Island be implemented as proposed? If not, what is the alternative you support? And I'll add to that the Queen's specific part. Do you support the um, location uh, that, the, uh, that the mayor has proposed for the Queen's Borough Jail? And as we continue to go around and rotate who goes first, Ms. Katz. I do not support the mayor's plan. I do believe in closing Rikers. It is inhumane. The culture of violence, the culture of drugs needs to be handled and needs to be stopped. We are sending people to Rikers and they are coming out much worse than they ever went in. But it is a large institution with thousands of people sitting there that ha are still waiting on bail and have never had their trial heard. But I do not believe in replacing one really bad big institution with four bad big institutions throughout the city of New York. If the whole purpose of closing Rikers was to lower the population, make sure people are getting the drug rehabilitation services they need, make sure that we are getting mental health services, make sure that people are getting their degrees, make sure they're getting school credits, then when we, when we talk about placing the jails, they have to be smaller jails that are able to accommodate the uses and the needs of the people that are in there. They must be close to families that, so that they can visit their families and have the infrastructure. But to be for a 1,500-person jail is not truly Thank for criminal justice much. reform. And by the way, I'll vote on it next week as borough president. Mr. Nieves. I'm against the mayor's plan for uh, creating four new jails in the city. I think it's, it's the wrong direction. I think it's the wrong ideas. Um, I think we need to decarcerate our population, and we can do it in, in, very f in five very simple ways, and that's one, ending cash bail. Uh, no one should be in, bail, in jail simply because they cannot afford their freedom. We also have to divert individuals from the criminal justice system. Nonviolent misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies uh, you know, being diverted from the criminal justice system. We have to get these individuals away from the criminal justice system and give them the opportunity to turn their life around. And then we also have to make sure we engage in alternative to incarceration programs. There's, there's 
so many ways you can hold somebody accountable for misconduct without incarceration. And that's what we have to start thinking about. That's how we, that's the broader idea of criminal justice reform is to think differently, to not incarcerate at first response, to try to find other ways of dealing with the issue. And we have to play fair in the criminal justice system. We have to give over discovery first instance possible so that cases get pushed through very quickly. Mr. We have to make sure we, we end uh, mass incarceration. Thank you. Mr. Lasak. Thank you. We all agree that the culture of violence must be stopped in Rikers Island. We must close Rikers Island prison by prison, but we cannot build neighborhood jails in Queens. We cannot put these jails in our neighborhood. While there's vacant space on Rikers Island where they can start building new state-of-the-art prisons that are safe for the inmates and safe for the correction officers. Right now there's two vacant jails on Rikers Island which used to hold 3,200 prisoners. If they can't be refurbished to make them state-of-the-art safe prisons for both inmates and the correction officers, then they can be knocked down and they could build new ones in their place. You should not put these prisons in the neighborhood. And to keep people close to the family is a good idea, but right away in Queens, 65% of the, 35% of those families don't live in Queens. Okay? Thank you. Mr. Lansman. Well, I'm proud to be the only candidate that fully supports the Lippman Commission plan to close Rikers Island. And I really think this is a litmus test for criminal justice reform. We need to close Rikers Island because it is a violent dystopian nightmare that no mayor, Republican or Democrat, has been able to fix. We've been successful in reducing the population at Rikers Island due to the policies that we have supported and promulgated in the city council. But if you're unwilling to say where you're going to put the jail that remains for, for people who are, are going to be incarcerated, then you are not serious about criminal justice reform. There has been a jail in Kew Gardens. It was closed a few years ago, but it's still there. We're going to rebuild the jail in that location. And it's not 1,500 uh, uh, bed jail anymore. It's already been negotiated down to, I think, 1,100, 1,150. So you cannot be for criminal justice reform if you are unwilling to tell people where you're going to put those people who are still going to be incarcerated. And I believe Thank firmly you. that they, those Mid. people, those human beings, our neighbors, our family, our friends, Mid. they deserve to be incarcerated close to their families, Thank close you. to their Ms. lawyers, Malik. close to the courthouse. So Rikers is an abomination and it needs to be closed down. I do not agree with the current plan of the mayor's proposal, but what I will say is this. In order to keep people out of the criminal justice system, it is very important to keep them connected with their support systems and their networks, their family, their friends, their legal counsel. Right now, we spend $42 million a year in transport transportation costs to get people who are incarcerated at Rikers Island to the various courthouses around the city. Sometimes the people who are supposed to go to Queens end up in the Bronx. And it is unfair to them because they have to wake up at 4 a.m to get to the courthouse on time for a 9.30, 10 o'clock call. This question came up so much, I held a panel discussion with Justice by Design and Public Square Media that came out with a mini documentary about what our new detention facilities could look like and how we could treat people more humanely so that those who are incarcerated and held can be treated like human Thank beings and not animals. Thank you, Ms. Lugo. I'm, I'm uh, against the mayor's plan. I'm for no neighborhood jails. And let's look at who is at Rikers. We need to start decarcerating Rikers. We do not need any more new jails because once you have a new jail, you're gonna fill it. And basically, I would have a decarceration project and I would include judges, uh, former judges, defense attorneys, legal aid attorneys, prosecutors, the community, faith-based organizations to review every conviction of the person who's sitting in Rikers. And if they could be let out based on the evaluation then it could be done by stipulation, not that you have to make a motion, the defense attorney would have to make a motion, then the judge has to rule on it. That's a lot of money involved. Let's decarcerate Rikers, let's close it down, build a smaller jail, but keep it in Rikers, and let's just empty out the people that are just there because they couldn't make bail. So if you have a petty larceny and the person didn't have $500 to pay its, their bail, they're in there. So that's, is that really necessary? All our tax dollars are going to house Thank the defendants you. in Rikers. Thank you. And Ms. Caban. 
Yes, Rikers Island absolutely needs to be closed. Uh, you know, when we talk about who's on Rikers Island, I'm really proud to have the endorsement of Akeem Browder, brother of Khalif Browder, somebody who languished on Rikers Island for years, accused of stealing a backpack. And his stay on Rikers Island, his caging on Rikers Island, directly led to his death. When we talk about who's on Rikers Island, we are overwhelmingly talking about people who have been found guilty of nothing and simply there because they are too poor to make their bail. People who are serving sentences for low-level offenses and short stints, where we really should look to replace with alternatives to incarceration um, and other services and supports. And then finally, people who are serving hits for technical violations of supervision. When you decarcerate those folks, we're talking about a minimal, minimal number of people where we say uh, that they should and must be removed from their communities. And we have to think about how better to deal with those situations. You know, I actually, I love the fact that we now have most people up here saying that we can't have these jails built because when you build jail cells, you fill them. Um, that's that's going to be my mantra always. Th the more it gets said, the better. Thank so you thank very you. much. Um, so given that we have a very short amount of time left and we do have seven candidates, we're going to make the next round 30-second responses instead of 60-second responses. Uh, and then if there's time, we'll do a brief lightning round of yes, no, or short answer at the very end. And uh, my co-moderator, Christine Chung, from the City News Organization, has the next question. Shortly after Chanel Lewis was sentenced to life without parole for the murder of 30-year-old Howard Beach jogger, Karina Vitrano, it was revealed that the NYPD collected DNA samples from over 350 men of color as part of the investigation. Chanel Lewis's defense attorney said that in both trials, they were not alerted to the DNA evidence by the prosecution, which is a Brady vi violation. If elected, what would you do to abide by the Brady Doctrine and to address potential prosecutorial misconduct? Mr. Nieves. You know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an ethics and professional responsibility unit that's going to look directly at any allegations of misconduct or any allegations of violations of Brady or Giglio by prosecutors. And this, this unit is going to be uh, staffed with multiple senior experienced attorneys and investigators, not from the district attorney's office in Queens, but from the U.S. attorney's office, from other jurisdictions that has no direct contact or a relation with the office of the Queens district attorney or any uh, officers in, in Queens. Mr. Lasek. I can't comment on the Chanel Lewis case specifically because I handled that case up, in, up until the trial and I resigned. Uh, but I will have week, a monthly meeting run by the Appeals Bureau Chief to educate the assistants on the latest law on Brady and discovery and make sure everyone is following the latest case law on it. Mr. Lansman. The dragnet of black men um, and taking their DNA samples, and now they're in a database that are there forever without any, almost any supervision whatsoever. It's just the start of the problems in the Chanel Lewis case. You had a young man with obvious learning disabilities who was kept away from his family. The first time in his, in his life he spent the night away from his family, was kept awake, was obviously interrogated vigorously outside of the, the, the videotaping process. During his confession, it was clear he didn't even understand that the uh, district attorney was not his own lawyer. He seemed to think that by pleading guilty, he would be eligible to particip participate in Thank some you. kind of program. Thank you. So what would you actually do to address prosecutorial misconduct? Um, as I've written, the prosecutors need to have a particular code of ethics. All of us as lawyers live under a code of ethics, but it's not geared specifically for prosecutors. Got it. Right. Thank you. Ms. Malik. So accountability is extremely important to me. I have held police officers accountable for their misconduct, and I plan as district attorney to hold prosecutors accountable for their misconduct as well. Improving the training program at the district attorney's office so that all prosecutors understand that we need to do open file discovery, advanced Brady disclosures, and I will have a comprehensive Brady policy, which is what I also did as deputy attorney general. Ms. Lugo? You need independence in, um, in the prosecu prosecutor's office, so prosecutorial misconduct will be referred to the appropriate agency, which would be the AG's office or a special prosecutor. You see, my condolences first have to go out to the Vetrano family because when we talk about the Chanel Lewis case, nobody ever talks about the family, and my condolences go out to the Vetrano family. However, the pressure to, to get somebody prosecuted for this crime it must be done with justice and fairness. And in this case, I don't believe it was Thank done. You. So you. to avoid that, I would have a unit that would make sure that there's no conflict of interest, whether the prosecutor or the law uh, enforcement officer I know each other. You have to cut that at the beginning. So that's but what I would do with the, the integrity end unit. Thank very you. Very soon. Ms. Caban. <laughs> 
Brady is the most abused rule in our district attorney's offices, and it's not covered by the discovery statute. Brady is a rule where essentially district attorneys are, are left to police themselves because by its definition, it's information that the defense doesn't have a reason to know about. So my policy is a zero tolerance policy when it comes to Brady violations because we are talking about people's lives. We need to retrain on Brady uh, and have zero tolerance for it going forward. Ms. Katz. My Conviction Integrity Unit will be reviewing the Chanel Lewis case. So, um, but in general, we need to videotape confessions, make sure they're done from the beginning to the end. We need to make sure the cases are reviewed. And when something like the Central Park Five comes out and the misconduct there, we need to make sure that we are reviewing all of uh, their cases as well. But we need to make sure, first of all, that we prosecute prosecutorial misconduct and police misconduct. Because when they walk into a courtroom, they are giving a higher standard of trust from the jury, from the whole courtroom. And so we need to hold them to a higher standard of accountability. Well, we've come to the end of our time for this candidate's debate. The candidates have been Queensborough President Melinda Katz. Did I say Queensborough? Queens District Attorney debate. Queensborough President <laughs> Melinda Katz, Jose Nieves, uh, former Deputy Chief in the New York State Attorney General's Office, Greg Lasak, former New York State Supreme Court Justice and Queens Prosecutor, Tiffany Caban, a public defender, Betty Lugo, former Nassau County Assistant District Attorney now in private practice, Mina Malik, former prosecutor in Queens and Washington, lecturer at Harvard Law School, and Queens City Councilman Rory Lansman. I want to thank my co-moderator, Christine Chung, the Queens correspondent for the new nonprofit news organization, The City. And audience here at the Green Space, please thank all the candidates for engaging today.